War between Sudan's military and a paramilitary group is in its seventh month with a death toll as estimated at 9,000, with another 5.6 million people forced to flee their homes, according to the United Nations. With most of the world's attention now on the Israeli-Hamas war, some analysts worry about the plight of the vulnerable in Sudan. Abdi Ismail Samatar is a professor at the University of Minnesota and a senator in the Somali parliament. He was also a member of the Pan-African Parliament. He tells VOA's Douglas Mpuga that the African Union has not done enough to contain the conflict. Yeah, you know, when I was in my last meeting at the Pan-African Parliament, the issue of the Sudan came up. And right there it was clear to me, although the Pan-African Parliament is an advisory body rather than a legislative body, that it was clear that we just don't have the wherewithal, moral or otherwise, to be able to address this question. So what what's taking place in particularly in Khartoum, but more broadly in the Sudan, are two people, just like the Somali warlords of the 1990s, and they are the ones who brought Mogadishu to its knees and destroyed the country and the possibility of that country recovering. If the African Union cannot see this coming and where it's going to go, then there should, the African Union itself should be disbanded because it's a talk shop rather than a shop that brings people together, have an agenda, protect our people, create peace where there's war, to create prosperity where there's poverty. And I just think the African people deserve better than what we have in the form of African Union presently. Uh, Sudanese have been suffering, depending on for international aid groups to, to feed them and to give them medical care. Uh, but we've seen countries like Rwanda send aid to Gaza. Whether we agree with the Paul Kagame or not, in terms of democracy and all of that jazz, it's very clear that Rwanda has got its act together. It's just kid children are going to good schools. The economy seems to be working very well and so on and so forth. So if they have the generosity of the spirit to see that they can provide food aid for sort of the people of Gaza, well, then I will say to that. That doesn't mean, therefore, Rwanda should not also take the leadership in addressing what's happening in the Sudan and particularly in Khartoum and in Darfur. And I think that should become a model for the rest of Africans. The Ethiopian government should be doing that. The Egyptian government should be doing that next door to them. Algerians should be doing that. The Nigerians, the South Africans. I spoke in that uh, Pan-African Parliament uh, meeting in May, and I said we should be able, if each and every country was able to donate $15, $20 million, for many countries, $20 million is not a lot of money. We could do a great deal to secure Khartoum. And if we secure Khartoum, the threat of the Sudan will fall into place. But it seems to me the quality of leadership in our continent at the level of the presidency or the premiership is not there to be able to address this. And therefore we begin to complain and then back. There are some who have blamed the fighting in Sudan between the two generals on foreign interests. Do you abide that argument? Whether we like it or not, foreign interests, they are going to get their licks in our continent, whether we like it or not, whether we want it or not. The question is not whether there's going to be an influence in there. I'm sure Israel is involved in that. Basically, with the U.S. government, it was able to convince the previous regime to sort of recognize Israel and have a sort of diplomatic relations with it. So, yes, it was there. But the question is, we can blame all we want others. The question is, this is our continent, this is our people, and uh, therefore, can we stand up to be counted? I mean, if we were able to have a standing army of about 15 to 20,000, the whole continent should be able to support that. ECOWAS is able to do that some of the time. And then we send these to the places where there is horrific humanitarian crisis, such as Khartoum in the Sudan. We are unable to do that. So blaming others for getting involved in this Well, that's the nature of politics in the contemporary world. They will get their licks in there if we don't have ours. Diara Congo's Electoral Commission confirmed on Friday a provisional list of 24 candidates who have registered for the presidential elections on December 20th. The candidates still need to be approved by the Constitutional Court with a final list due to be published on November 18th. President Felix Chekedi, who came to power in 2018, submitted his candidacy for a second five-year term in office in early October. Given the fluctu- 
given the fracture, the opposition, the 60-year-old is in a good position, said Congolese political scientist Christian Moleka. He is the incumbent. He has the resources of the state. People still believe in him, and he is managed to build strategic alliances, he added. The divided political opposition would need to unite around a single candidate to stand a chance of beating Tshekedi, according to Moleka. Tshekedi's biggest opponents include noble Roland Dennis Mukwege, wealthy businessman and former governor of Katanga Moise Katumbi, and Martin Fayulu, an unsuccessful candidate in the 2018. MP Delisa Sanga and former Prime Ministers Adolf Muzito and Augustine Matata Ponyo are also in the race, the, the latter facing charges for embezzlement. There is only one woman among the 24 candidates, Mali Jose Ifoku Mputa, who also ran in the 2018 elections. The political climate in the Democratic Republic of Congo has been tense for months with opposition parties claiming the elections will be rigged. The presidential election will be coupled with legislative, provincial and communal elections for which thousands of candidates have registered. <laughs>